Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this week's edition of the Brazilian Algebraic Geometry Seminar. Uh, I ask everyone to turn off their microphones so that we have any, uh, we do not have any background noise. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Hugo Bruzzo speaking this week. He's uh, currently a sister and also visiting the Universidade Federal da Paraíba. And he'll talk about the uh, Mackay correspondence in three dimensions. Hugo, please. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank the coordinators of the seminar for proposing me to give this talk. And I'm very happy to be in Brazil, at least virtually. As I was saying before starting, I was supposed to be in Brazil uh, personally, but uh, I had a flight March 13, they canceled my flight and apparently I lost the, the, last, op the last opportunity. So I'm stuck in Trieste. And um, Okay, so concerning my talk, it is partly a review of uh, standard facts about the McKay correspondence in three dimensions and partly an exercise. So I really am not going to, to tell you uh, many original results, at least uh, many original results done by me and my collaborator, just a, just a little bit. And also let me start by saying that um, uh, this is um, different, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to, to, to prepare this talk, I took uh, pieces from different uh, papers and the work I've been doing with many collaborators. So we wrote these two papers, uh, more or less written mostly in uh, physical language and uh, or pseudo physical language. And also I'm a collaborating, I mean, um, these Grafeo and Paragin are two students of mine and they are doing something related to, to this stuff. So, um, so the, the mathematical problem is the following, or at least part of the problem is the following. We have a, a finite subgroup of SL3C, which we call G. And then we take uh, the quotient C3 mod G, say the fine quotient. And uh, then we want to find uh, possibly crepant resolutions of singularities of this quotient. And we want to describe the geometry. And the gist of the Mackay correspondence is that the geometry of this desingularization is fully encoded in, in the group G, in particular uh, in the representations of this uh, group G. Also, uh, very much as in the case uh, of, this, of the standard uh, McKay correspondence in two dimensions, there's also a, let's say, differential geometric description of the same, uh, of the same construction, which here, this is a actually Keller quotient construction, and I called it a Cronheimer-like construction. And uh, it turns out that this is more suited than the GIT construction or description to deal with uh, physical applications. And the geo differential geometric description turns out to be much closer to what is the application uh, uh, to physics uh, uh, of this stuff. And uh, actually, uh, there's been a work a few years ago about uh, this the singularization. They turn out to be modular spaces of uh, some objects that are called G constellations. And uh, they are obtained by uh, GIT. So there's a stability parameter around. And uh, then you want, the, which is uh, correspond to the level sets uh, in the Kähler quotient construction. And then one wants to understand the, the chamber structure for this stability parameter, what happens on the walls, etc. And what I will do is to review some uh, facts about uh, the uh, this uh, three-dimensional um, McKay correspondence. Uh, uh, and uh, um, there's a basic paper which is due to Ito and Reed 
and more papers, the, especially in connection with the, the relation with the Kehler quotient construction. There are unpublished papers by a guy, Italian, I think, who uh, wrote a thesis in Oxford. His name is Sardo Inferri. And, um, and more recent uh, uh, works by uh, Crow, Ishii, and other people. And uh, I will use uh, an example, which is uh, C3, modulo in action of the cyc cyclic group Z4, as an example. It's an example which is doable in, the, in detail. It's not entirely trivial, and uh, it helps to understand what's going on. And, uh, it, it helps as a warm up to um, tackle more difficult problems. Part of this uh, uh, project, uh, I mean, th th these crepant resolutions turn out to be so called locally calabi yaws. So they have, uh, of course, they are non compact, but uh, they carry, they have a trivial canonical bundle, of course. And uh, so uh, they might carry uh, rich flat uh, matrix. And so part of the program is to find these Ricci flat matrix uh, on these uh, uh, resolutions. And this is a, a very tricky problem. It's a complicated problem. So a key, uh, a key notion in, um, in this theory is the notion of age. So if uh, um, G is our group, so every element in the group is some finite order R, and uh, you, let's call, you, we are representing G into a cell 3C. Uh, by the way, the choice of a cell 3C is also because uh, in that way, the singularities that you get are Gorenstein. Uh, so if lambda one, two, three are the eigenvalues of G regarded as a matrix in a cell 3C, then you can write, uh, and you can write these uh, as uh, exponents of a primitive uh, root of the unity of order R, and you have uh, some exponents, uh, AI, and you arrange, um, you call age, uh, the normalized sum of, uh, of these exponents, okay? And uh, normalized with respect to the order of the element. So this is the age of the element. Actually, it is, um, uh, actually, the age, the age depends uh, on the conjugacy class of G, of course. And in three dimensions, as we are working now, the age may be 0, 1, and 2. So age 0 only corresponds to the identity. And then the classes whose age is 1 are called junior. And the classes that, uh, whose age is 2 are called senior. So up to the trivial uh, class, we have junior and senior classes. And I will write gamma i for the set of conjugacy classes of age i, okay? Uh, and we won't apply this, uh, of course, to the singularization, the desingularization. So in particular, these are minimal models. And therefore, uh, what I, I will use this uh, definition of minimal model of x. So this is a projective morphism, which is crepant, and um, the, the variety Y that we have on top is a Q factorial and has terminal singularities. So here in the notes, if somebody wants to read, I've written the meaning of Q factorial. So every file divisor, real divisor is a multiple, which is Cartier. And, uh, uh, and the notion of singularities, uh, uh, terminal singularities, right? So the so-called discrepancies, so the coefficients of the irreducible components of uh, the exceptional divisor, these AI are positive, okay? So this is a minimal model. And in particular, in our case, where X is this uh, a fine quotient C3 mod G, for G, a finite subgroup of a Z3C, a minimal model exists, and one can prove that it is a Q cohomology. No, 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 no. Um, Q cohomology manifolds, what is written again in, uh, in this note, it's called some, some cohomological condition. But the issue here 
is that on, Q, on a Q cohomology manifold, you have Poincare duality. The condition for uh, a sufficient condition to have a Poincare duality. And of course, since our variety is not compact, we have duality between uh, usual, so to say, standard uh, cohomology and uh, cohomology with compact uh, uh, supports. Okay, so we do have. Uh, um, we do have a Poincare duality. And then uh, this is the theorem which was proved uh, by Ito and Reed, which indeed establishes, as I was saying, a, a, a close relation between, in particular, the age of uh, the um, irreducible um, conjugacy classes of elements uh, of the group. Uh, and uh, uh, the structure of the exceptional divisors of the resolution of singularities. So why is the resolution of singularity of X? And then what happens is that, uh, for instance, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the set of senior classes and the basis, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the compact exceptional prime divisors, so the reducible compact irreducible components of the exceptional locus. Uh, a basis, uh, this generate in our situation, this generate uh, the, the second cohomology of Y with compact support. So this is another set which is in one-to-one -one correspondence, a basis for this cohomology group. And of course, uh, by Poincare duality, a basis for H4 of, uh, of Y. And the same happens, uh, I mean, we, we have another one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of junior classes, all exceptional prime divisors, so compact or not, a basis for the full second cohomology group, and of course, a dual basis of H4 with the compact supports. Okay, so, so we have these two, uh, I mean, you have one-to-one -one correspondences be between these uh, two sets of, uh, of objects. Okay, and uh, we shall see this at work uh, in the example I've chosen to, uh, to illustrate uh, the general theory and, and some uh, feature uh, of, the, uh, of this construction. Okay, so this is the idea senior uh, or junior classes are in correspondence with the compact or non -com or, or all uh, exceptional irreducible components of the exceptional locus of the resolution. And for instance, uh, let, uh, our example with Z4 is the following. So we are considering the action of Z4 on C3, which is induced by this transformation. Okay, this is a, sorry. This is an action of, of Z4. Of course, this group is abelian, so elements correspond to conjugacy, conjugacy classes. And, the, and uh, we have four of them, of course, because we have four elements. And uh, uh, so we, ha we have the identity, whose we'll age vector is zero. And then we have the element G0. And, uh, and if you compute the eigenvalues and the order, of course, the order is four. You get one four to one one two, and so this is junior. The age is one, and then we have uh, a compact uh, a component of the exceptional divisor. <clears throat> and uh, no, sorry, no. Uh, we have a component of uh, which is um, because the junior class is a, a label uh, all of them. Indeed, uh, we also have uh, uh, an, the square of, of G zero, which is of order two. And the age uh, is, uh, I mean, the age vector is this one, one half, one, one, zero. This is again junior, right? The sum is, is, is one. And this is, a, 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 a no, is going to be a non-compact um, component. Why we know that the first is compact and the second non-compact? This is because G0 is dual to the only senior class. We have this class corresponding to G0 cube whose age is two, so it's a senior, and so it must correspond to uh, a, a compact component. And it is dual to G, G0, it's the inverse, right, of G0. 
and uh, and therefore this is exactly the compact component which co corresponds to the first junior class. So of course we have no idea of the geometry of this resolution in concrete. Uh, we didn't build it, but we already know uh, that we have one compact and one non-compact divisor. And therefore, in particular, uh, as we saw, this also tells us uh, the structure of the cohomology of, uh, of this resolution of singularity. Okay, so we have these cohomologies uh, very easily. <clears throat> Okay, and for the, well, what is that in the abelian case, uh, you can always uh, study this uh, using toric geometry. I mean, you can study the resolution of singularities in particular using uh, toric geometry. And this is also technically used in the paper by Ito and Reed, who first prove the abelian case, even the, the cyclic case, they establish the theorem for the cyclic case using Tori geometry, and then they have an algebraic technique to reduce the general case to the cyclic case. It's a very complicated paper, not easy to read at all, but anyway, in the nutshell, this is what they do. First, they study the cyclic case using toric geometry, and then they move to the general case by a reduction process. So I will do this very humbly uh, in the case of our concrete example. So, uh, so we have uh, the variety C3 mod Z4, and basically what you do by using a minimal set of rational invariants uh, um, of the action of Z4, so rational, I mean, uh, you, you pick up three independent rational functions of uh, X, Y, Z, uh, which uh, generate um, the, the invariant ring. And, uh, and you, uh, there is a technique in toric geometry to construct the fan which, uh, uh, the fan which represents uh, the, the, um, the variety. You do the computations and uh, making some choices which are completely material. For instance, you get these three vectors. Okay, V1, V2, V3. And, and then uh, basically this, uh, this is a fine toric variety corresponds to just one cone of maximal dimension. This cone is indeed the cone generated uh, by the three vectors, so this cone is sigma. And then what you do is that you take the dual cone. Uh, um, so this cone uh, sigma lives uh, in, in a let tensored by the real numbers. The, let's say that the, the, the lattice is capital N. And then M, this M here is the dual lattice. And inside the dual lattice, you have the dual cone, which basically is the cone whose uh, points all have uh, a no negative um, action on the elements of sigma. This is the definition of the dual cone. And you take only the rational points uh, of the dual cone, the points which uh, lies on, on the dual lattice. And this is a semigroup, S sigma, associated to the cone. You take the, the algebra generated by this semigroup, you take the spectrum, and what you get is the toric variety, the fine toric variety X, which in our case is exactly C3 mod Z4. Uh, Tori geometry also offers a way to represent explicitly this uh, as an affine variety, as a locus in some affine space. And uh, this is done by the following procedure. So this is a kind of a review of some standard facts in toric geometry. Uh, first, uh, uh, you look for a minimal set of generators of the semigroup which includes the rational generators of the rays of a sigma dual. So the, the rays are, okay, the edges, okay, one dimensional edges of, the, of the, this cone. This cone in our case is three dimensional and it has a three, uh, three rays. Um, and then you look for a minimal set of generators of the semigroup, which includes the rational generators of the rays. This is called a Hilbert basis. It's not a basis because the elements are not independent uh, over Z, okay, because the, you have relations. 
but it's called the Hilbert basis. Ah. Um, and uh, um, it, in our case, uh, so you have to do some computations and we develop this small package with Mathematica to compute the Hilbert basis. There exist many more in, uh, in, uh, around uh, but uh, on the market, but they are very complicated. So we made a very small, uh, simple package in Mathematica. And uh, in our case, uh, you so you find the generators, they are nine. This, since to any generator you associate a variable in a defined space, this means that in this way, uh, our variety embeds into C9. Uh, and, therefore, and uh, clearly there are six relations which relate uh, uh, these uh, generators. And uh, um, they define a, an idea clearly, right? Uh, this is what is called an, a, a toric ideal. The Emily is generated by, by, by uh, binomials. Generated by binomial. It's not the ideal, which it's very well known. This is not the ideal which cuts X in C9. It's not the ideal of X as a, in a finite variety in C9, because what you have to do is a saturation process. So what happens is that this ideal, um, the fine variety associated to this idea is reducible uh, with uh, components of different dimensions. And our variety is just one of these components. So you have to go and, and pick it up. You need a way to, to pick up just the component you are interested in. And this is obtained, this is a standard issue in toric geometry. It is obtained by a process which is called a uh, process which is called saturation of two ideals. It's the usual definition. So if you have two ideals, the, uh, the saturation of I with respect to J is defined in this way, okay? Is the, set, is the ideal of elements in A such that F and J is in I for N big enough. And then general theory says that uh, from the idea, you, you have to take uh, the ideal which um, we obtain using a, um, a Hilbert basis of the semigroup. And you have to saturate with respect to the ideal generated by the product of all variables. Okay. And you get a new idea. This is the ideal which picks up the, our, the component which corresponds to, to our uh, a fine variety, which is a C3 mod Z4 in this case. And this idea is generated by 20 quadratic binomials. Okay, so expressed in this way, this uh, variety is very far from being a complete intersection. Okay, it is a codimension six and it is determined by 20 equations. Actually, the same construction can be obtained use the, do, constructing the usual affine GIT quotient. And this is interesting because it gives also a handle to another representation of the variety, which is important when you go looking for um, actually Ricci flat matrix. Um, so the, uh, the usual uh, affine GIT quotient, of course, is simply you take the invariant subring of the coordinate ring of C3 and take the spectrum. And um, so you get, uh, and you get the same description in the sense that uh, um, when you look for uh, the idea, uh, I mean, the, the, this uh, uh, invariant subring has nine generators. They happen to be, uh, he, even, uh, although here they play a different role, the invariant generators happen to be exactly these uh, nine monomials. Uh, you see, they are actually, they come with a weight. They come with a weight. Uh, X and Y have a weight one. I mean, when you construct, they are simply monomials. Uh, when you look at this as the, 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 the invariant subring, but they don't have all the same degree. The fact is that this is somehow related to the to the um, weighted projective space P112, and therefore the variables Z, y, uh, X, Y, Z come with a weight, 
the weight of x and y is one, the weight of z is two, so everything is uh, of weight four here. And this is indeed the basis of this uh, invariant uh, subring. So uh, again, we have a, um, a variety in C9, and when you look for the relations, so you look for the ideal gene cutting the variety, you get exactly the same 20 uh, polynomials, 20 quadrics, um, as we obtained using toric geometry. Actual this construction shows that uh, uh, what you, uh, you can describe X as the fine cone over the image of a generalized Veronese embedding. Generalized because this embedding starts from a projective weighted projective space. It's an embedding of P112 into P8, which is given by the line bundle O4. O4, this is not, um, I mean, is locally free, is a line bundle of P112. So it's classes in the Picard group. Uh, and uh, if you describe the space of global sections, of this line bundle, you get exactly the same uh, generators of the invariant ring. Um, this, by the way, this line bundle is minus, uh, is the dual of the canonical bundle OP112, and we shall, this I believe uh, is related to what we are going to discover using some toric geometry again. So this X is uh, the affine cone over some of a Veronese embedding from P112, and we shall meet P112 again. Okay. Let me check the time. Um, okay, for instance, so you can construct the full resolution using toric geometry, and then we know the reason why the variety is singular is that the cone is not basic. I mean, the three rational generators of the cone are not the basis of Z3. This is the reason from the viewpoint of toric geometry of the fact that the variety is singular. And then what you have to do is to cut the cone into subcones that are basic. Namely, the, the, each cone is three generators, rational generators, and the three generators are a basis of Z3. Z3. Okay, and then uh, the variety, which is no longer a fine, of course, because we have in particular, in this case, a, a, a fine formed by four cones, uh, will be, uh, will be uh, smooth. And since uh, uh, actually we hope there's a, a a crepant resolution, there's a way of finding the new rays. No? So what we have to do here is to add some rays and use them to cut the original cone into sub cones. And then what you do is the following. This uh, is uh, this drawing here on the lower right. Is there is the, I mean, the, the blue dots are the points in, in, the, in, the, in the lattice. And then we have uh, uh, the black arrows that are the, the generators of the cone. And then you take the triangle with, uh, with these ver vertexes, the triangle whose vertexes are the tips of the generators of the, are the, generators, uh, uh, of the rays. And you look for the, the rational points on the triangle, the points that lie on the, on the, um, on the lattice. There are two. And uh, these uh, uh, graphs on the left are what I like to call the planar graphs. So the first is the planar graph of the original fan. So we just have one cone. And then here we have uh, the two additional um, points uh, or rays uh, that we added, W2, W3. And already here we see that uh, we have uh, first the new rays uh, correspond to the components uh, of the exceptional divisor. So we, we shall have two components. And uh, uh, actually the fact that W3 is in the interior of the triangle means that the uh, correspondent component uh, of the exceptional divisor is compact. And the fact that W2 is on a one edge means that the corresponding component is non-compact. So you, you read everything just by looking at the planar graph. 
And then you can compute, again, using toric geometry, you can really compute the two components and you find that the, co the, 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 co the compact component is, the, is a, a copy of the second Hitzeberg surface and the non-compact component is P1 times C. Uh, and also, uh, if you look at the new fan, there's a way to understand that the variety that you have is the total space of the canonical bundle of the second Hitzeberg surface. Because you start from the fan of the second Hitzeberg surface, uh, you know what the can canonical bundle of a, of a um, second Hitzeberg surface is, and then there's a way to compute uh, the fan corresponding to to the total space of it, and you get exactly the same fan or, a, or an equivalent fan. In particular, with these choices, you get exactly the same fan. Um, okay, so now we have a handle on the structure, the full structure of the, this resolution singularities. Uh, if you regard this resolution singularities as the total space of a canonical bundle, the compact divisor is just the zero section of it. Okay, it's a copy of F2, which is the zero section of this, uh, of this line band. And uh, of course, what you can do is uh, to, you can add just one ray if you want. Uh, and what you get is a partial desingularization. So it's something which dominates uh, the, the quotient C3 mod Z4 but uh, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it is only less singular, but it's not smooth. In this way, what you get again, you, by the same analysis, you only have one compact component of the exceptional divisor. And uh, this is the total space of the canonical bundle of uh, projective, weighted projective space B112. This is related to the fact that uh, uh, the blow up of the singularity of the projective space is the second Hitzeberg surface. So of course, Y3 is not a minimal model, in particular is not a desingularization. This is related with a fact which is contained uh, in, in an old paper by Grauert, which shows that if you have uh, on, uh, on a variety you have uh, a vector bundle actually whose dual is ample, then the zero section of the, uh, of the original uh, vector bundle is an exceptional locus. Um, it, uh, it can be contracted. And indeed, this is what happens in our case. The dual of K is actually ample. So you can uh, do this and uh, you, you get exactly the blowdown. But you, you know, you apply this idea, you get exactly the blow down. Just a side remark. And now I would like to, now that we have understand uh, um, completely, I would say the situation with an example of the three dimensional McKay correspondence, let's uh, go on in the general theory. And let me show you this notion that was uh, introduced uh, as far as I know, by Crow and Ishii, namely the notion of G constellation. So we shall call R the regular representation of, of our group. So it's uh, the representation of G on the vector space uh, generated by G itself uh, over the complex numbers. Uh, so simply the, the elements of G are regarded as the basis of the space and you act on them with the G itself. And uh, uh, first, uh, is, and this is standard uh, notation, a G sheaf on C3 is a coherent sheaf together with the G action, which covers the action of G on the space C3. Okay, so we have an equivalent G sheaf. We call it a G constellation if it's a space of a global section is isomorph, which, is, which of course is a, a representation of G, is isomorphic to as a representation to the regular representation, is the regular representation, okay? So the G constellation is G sheaf whose uh, global sections are the regular representation. And uh, uh, you say the two G constellations are isomorphic if they are isomorphic as G sheaves. Okay, so we have this notion of a G constellation. 
And uh, um, we have a notion of stability for G constellations. Uh, and uh, the space of stability conditions is uh, uh, the space of homomorphisms uh, uh, of the um, representation ring of the group G with the values in Q. And we normalize them. We normalize them with the condition that uh, uh, they are zero on the regular representation. And then we say that the G constellation is theta stable. So the G constellation is F. This is theta, theta stable whenever, for every um, proper uh, non trivial uh, uh, G equivalent coherent subsheaf E, theta of uh, the global sections of E is uh, positive, right? The global sections are a representation. The, so the global section of F are the regular representations, presentation. The global section of E, which is, which is not a constellation, it's just a, a G sub sheaf of, of F, anyway, is a representation. And you ask the theta on this representation is positive. Okay? So this is the notion of stability condition that we have for a G constellation. And semi-stability, of course, we all also um, allow for equality. And, uh, and this is also, this definition is also the notion of genericity that you have, for instance, uh, for quiver representations. You say that the stability parameter theta is generic if for that value of the parameter, stability and semi-stability are equivalent. Okay, such a representation, a stability parameter, sorry, is called the generic. And then you can uh, uh, construct a modular space of G constellations using GIT quotient, and then what you do, as usual, you start from, uh, from uh, an affine space. So this is the space of um, triples of um, G invariant triples of uh, endomorphisms of the regular representation. And inside this vector space, uh, you cut an affine locus N by taking uh, uh, the triples that commute in this sense. So I mean, people, this is of course very much, uh, th this looks like some ADHM construction. No? It's the usual stuff that people know from ADHM uh, parameterization of sheaves, uh, from quiver representation theory, it's very similar. So you, you consider this N and on this N, you have an action of the G invariant uh, uh, general linear group uh, of R, uh, which splits, uh, of course, according to the reducible representations um, of, of the group. So you can, you can write it as a product of the general linear groups uh, of the say of the repre irreducible representations like this. And since also actually there is an invariance under an homotety, as it happens uh, in this kind of problems, uh, you actually take uh, the projective general linear group, uh, always a G invariant. And then uh, what you do is you take uh, uh, the, the set of uh, stable points according to our definition after choosing a, a stability parameter and you take the GIT quotient with respect to this group. So you get some space and, uh, and actually um, you can interpret this uh, as a fine modular, as a, as a modular space of G constellations that it, and which turns out to be fine because you have, uh, of course, uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, since uh, the space is this one and we have this, uh, uh, skew symmetry, condi symmetry condition, uh, you have a, a map from the dual of the symmetric algebra of C3 to the endomorphisms. Uh, yeah? You get it from here. And this gives a, maps, uh, a map from this uh, space to this. Why this uh, gives a constellation? This is uh, explained a little better in the next slide. Uh, because uh, a G constellation, uh, we, we can identify C3 with the spectrum, uh, of course, uh, of the symmetric the dual 
of the symmetric algebra of C3, which is just a space of polynomials in three variables, right? So for this reason, the G constellation is a G equivariant uh, uh, module structure on R. On R. And, uh, and therefore, for this reason, just by taking, uh, uh, if you want, uh, um, no, this is wrong. I should have written something different here. This is tautological. Uh, so F is the, is the is the localization of R of the module R, okay, with this representation that you get uh, uh, from this uh, stru module structure on R. So this is uh, this is stupid. Of course, this is true on an affine scheme. Uh, here, uh, H zero C three F is R, okay, with this uh, structure, and. Um, so we have this space. In particular, this space has a map to uh, a claim to be proved, of course, I'm not doing it here, that this is a modular space of G constellations on C3, of stable G constellation on C3. And, uh, um, and there's a natural map on C3 mod G, uh, which simply sends G constellation to its support which is uh, actually an orbit of G, is a G invariant, is actually an orbit of G. And therefore, uh, you have a map, uh, C3 mod G is the space of orbits, uh, and therefore you have a map uh, from M theta to C3 mod G, okay? And uh, for this, uh, we might hope that M theta is a resolution singularities of C3 mod G. And um, concerning what happens when we, go to zero parameter uh, stability parameter, there's a funny phenomenon here. If the fixed locus of the G action on C3 is compact, which means that's just the origin, then M0 is what you expect to be, the, the, uh, the, the singular quotient uh, C3 mod G. Otherwise, uh, if, uh, again, if the fixed locus is not compact, and this is exactly what happens in our case because uh, the Z uh, axis in this example is fixed, is a fixed locus. Then C, uh, M0 is, is uh, reducible. It may have many reducible components. And one of them is uh, the quotient C3 mod G. Uh, there may be many more reducible components containing stuff that you really don't understand what it is, at least in this example. And, uh, and also, um, we have, uh, uh, I guess I'm supposed to talk one hour, right? Yes, yes, one hour. Okay, uh, of course, I'm, uh, I'm running out of time, but this isn't the best tradition. Uh, so there are also tautological, band tautological bundles on, the, on this uh, quotient because you simply take the trivial bundle, uh, you make it into a G equivariant bundle by tensoring by the, you attain it by tensoring the structure shift by the regular representation. So you get uh, a G equivariant uh, bundle, which therefore descends to a bundle on M theta. And when you decompose the regular representation into, the reduce, into its irreducible pieces, uh, you get a bunch, a number of uh, vector bundles that are called the tautological bundles. And uh, this uh, slide, I think, is uh, quite interesting because uh, uh, actually what uh, these constellations relate uh, to the equivariant Hilbert scheme of C3, and very often they coincide with it. And therefore, a first result in this, uh, situ this uh, the first result are from the very early 2000s, 2000, 2001. So for instance, Nakamura showed that this G Hilbert scheme is a Crepan resolution of a C3 mod G when G is a billion. And then the, it's a famous paper by Bridget Lanking and, and, and Reed, which is called something like Mukai implies McKay, where they use for a Mukai transform. Uh, uh, they showed uh, that uh, the, the, the bounded derived category of the equivalent Hilbert scheme of C3 is equivalent to the G uh, equivariant bounded category of C3. 
and uh, and this uh, relates and produces the fact that uh, what uh, Nakamura proved for G abelian is true in general for any finite subgroup uh, of a cell tree C. And then, as I was saying, I believe that the mismatch in, in the years is due to the publication time of the of the papers. Ito and Nakajima in 2000 showed that uh, for some uh, uh, chambers, which still we have to define, uh, of uh, uh, for theta in some chambers of the stabili pa uh, stability parameter space, uh, actually m theta is the Gheta schema. So the constellations are reduced to G equivariant zero cycles. And, uh, and, uh, and now for G a billion, Croe in 2004, if I remember, yeah, I think it's correct, yeah, 2004, proved that these constellations, when theta is generic, are always a crepal resolution singularities of, of the quotient, of the singular quotient. And uh, perhaps here I will, I will be brief. Uh, you can uh, uh, put up a Kähler, uh, a Kähler description of all this, uh, where uh, instead of the, uh, that con I mean, uh, the, the fine variety that you cut from uh, some vector space or a fine space N is due by some level set of a, uh, of a moment matter. And then you know that if the parameter zeta is non-zero, it's, uh, it's sufficiently generic, what you get is uh, a smooth quotient. And uh, in, this, uh, in this setting, the, and this actually means that uh, this space, so this fine variety is the total space of, of, of a principal bundle because now the action of the compact form of our group is free. Okay, so you have a principal fiber bundle and you get a variety M theta. Note that the font of M is different. Okay, it's not script because this in principle might be different. And, uh, and since uh, this is a principal bundle in a natural way, you can construct the tautological bundles as associated bundles. And uh, here you can prove that the bundles generate the, the K theory group, the Grotendieck group uh, of this uh, quotient, and also that the churn character are a basis of the cohomology ring of M theta. Um, and actually, what happens, however, is that when theta is generic, uh, the two spaces, what you get from GIT construction and from the Keller. Uh, quotient construction rhizomorphic, or better, better said, the, the underlying analytical space of this modular space of a constellation is this quotient, which, which uh, uh, was born as a, as a, a analytical, analytic variety. So let me spend, uh, I'm not going to deal with the physics really, but uh, I would just uh, to like, I would like to give you the idea that all this has a physical meaning, or at least uh, as a meaning in the theory, in some theories that uh, are supposed to be physics, let's say. Uh, in particular, uh, we have some special uh, uh, class of gauge theories. I don't want to, to, to go into it. Uh, uh, it's a three-dimensional churn simons gauge, gauge theory with the two supersymmetries. Uh, and in particular, the way we get uh, our objects uh, uh, via Keller quotient construction is very well suited to allow comparison uh, with physics. And this is a kind of dictionary. Uh, what I want to say is just that everything that we have on the, and, and these are notions that we have already used, uh, more or less, has a physical counterpart. So for instance, uh, the space of the linear data we started from, uh, they correspond to so-called the West Zumino fields in the theory. You have a gauge group, moment map, this is a scalar potential. Even the stability parameters in physics are regarded as fields. They are called Faye-Iopoulos parameters. 
The quadratic constraints uh, actually uh, are given by a cubic potential, and this is a meaning in physics. And uh, as usual, our modular space, which is a minimal creep and resolution of C3 mod gamma, in physics becomes the manifold of the classical vacua of the theory, as it happens in, in gauge theory. And the wall crossing, which is a, a transition from two different manifolds of classical vacua, is what in physics is called a phase transition. Okay, so we have a full, complete uh, dictionary. Um, and then let me just spend the last few uh, seven, the last seven minutes, or more or less, to talk about the chamber structure. So we uh, of the uh, space of stability parameters. So, so we have uh, again. This is the definition. This big. Uh, Theta is the space of uh, stability conditions. And then uh, there's, uh, you can prove, it was proved by Croatia in the paper, that uh, if you take uh, what we call the generic uh, stability parameters, this subset is open and dense, and it's a disjoint union of finitely many, finitely many open convex polyhedral cones. And uh, therefore, the complement of this inclusion is formed by the faces of the cones. Uh, and uh, uh, these are called uh, the walls. So these cones are called chambers and the faces are called the wall. Uh, in particular, uh, the faces uh, of, the, of uh, uh, to be more precise, the faces of dimension one are called walls and the faces of dimension one are called G's. Okay, so we have the usual um, thing and uh, what happens is that uh, you can prove that uh, if you move uh, the stability parameter, for instance, in the interior of a chamber, uh, the modular space doesn't change uh, the usual uh, behavior. And also, if you take the relative interior of a wall, so in the for a generic point of the wall, so to say, the modular space doesn't change. So it makes sense to introduce this issue. You fix, for instance, a chamber and you consider the modular space MC, or you fix a wall and you have the modular space MW. And when W is a wall of C, there's a contraction morphism between the, uh, the two modular spaces. And uh, actually now there is a classification and you call the wall of type zero if the contraction actually is an isomorphism. Of type one, if it contracts curves to points, which more or less means that when you go through a wall, you have uh, flops and flips. And um, type three, if the contraction morphism gamma W contracts divisors to curves. This is what will happen in our case. And actually, you could think of the about the existence of walls of type two, where you contract a divisor to a point, but in this problem, they don't exist. Okay, there is no contraction which sends a, a, a point, a divisor to a point. And what is interesting is that even when uh, you have a wall of type zero, so when you cross the wall, the modular space doesn't change, uh, the vector bundles may change. The tautological vector bundles may change. So it's a kind of change of basis either in the Grothendieck group or in the cohomology ring um, that you get when you uh, cross a wall, even in the case uh, the wall is of type zero. And for instance, this is the chamber structure of, the, of our example. Of course, it's very hard now to understand anything. And the, uh, actually what happens is that uh, there are eight chambers. And for instance, this thing which has a, which is a more or less green, is a, this a cone uh, and the point uh, here is the vertex of the cone. So this is the farthest point from you. And then the cone op opens towards it. Okay, so you have uh, such cones. And here we try to give an idea you know, drawing just four cones. You have this uh, cone structure. And uh, uh, I'm not going to, uh, to tell you in detail how we solve the problem. We solve the problem, uh, I mean, the, the problem I mean of determining 
determining the, the chamber structure, in particular to compute the walls, using the Kehler uh, uh, construction, uh, because uh, I, I forgot to mention that, uh, but actually when you compare, when you compare the, what is it? When you compare the GIT construction with the Kehler quotient construction, there's a relation between the stability parameter and the, and the level value, Z, the stability parameter theta, and, and the level value uh, of the moment map uh, zeta. They are basically the same. So this formula is a little complicated, but uh, in practice, you may think they, they coincide. They are exactly the same thing. So also using the Kehler um, quotient construction, you can determine the, the chamber structure, you can compute the walls, and this is what we did just computing, computing uh, the, the, the tautological bundles and all of that using Mathematica. Okay, so we did it using Mathematica. And, uh, and then we found the following results, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, actually, it, it, in our case, which is a C3 mod Z4, we know there's just one resolution singularities. So that means that uh, um, uh, according to Crow Ishii's theorem, in all uh, uh, chambers, you find the same uh, resolution of singularities. So any generic stability parameter corresponds to the unique full resolution of singularities. And this also uh, um, is consistent with the following fact. All walls are of type zero, so nothing happens. Uh, but there's one wall which is of type three. This shrinks the divisor to curves. And then it's, uh, uh, it cannot but happen that when you go through such a, a wall and you re-emerge on the other side, you get uh, the, the, um, the same uh, variety because the resolution, the blow up of a divisor is unique. There is no space for doing it in a different way. While in the case uh, of flops, uh, of course, you can contract a, a curve uh, and then you can explode another curve. No? It's a standard phenomenon, but with divisors, this is not possible. And therefore everything is, is consistent. Uh, everywhere we find just uh, the same variety for generic value of the stability parameter and there are no walls of type one. Um, and uh, on the wall of type three, we find uh, the, what is the partial resolution singularities. With, uh, that we call the uh, um, uh, epsilon three, uh, sorry, y three. Um, we, we find y three. Um, uh, where, which just has a one uh, uh, reduced uh, compact divisor. And indeed what happened is that the non-compact divisor P1 times C has shrunk to the Z axis. And, um, on, on the walls of type zero, you will find why, and it may be interesting that this is a, perhaps an interesting phenomenon. On one edge, so it's not, uh, we are not talking about the generic points of a wall. We find a variety which is not uh, a resolution even partial of singularities, because you will get a variety which is C times uh, the resolution of singularities of the A1 singularity in two dimensions. So it's the uh, ALE space of type A1. Okay. And the projection to our variety is two to one. So it's not birational to C3 mod Z4. The projection is, is S degree two. So I think this doesn't contradict anything because we're not in a, in a generic point of a world. And uh, I guess it's more or less time to finish. And uh, uh, let me just mention one interesting thing and two uh, lines of uh, uh, research we are following now. The first is that, uh, as I mentioned the, uh, the briefly, uh, our uh, modular spaces of G constellations are fine modular spaces. So on the product of one of them times C3, there is a universal constellation, which is a sheaf. 
So you may use it to define a Fourier Mukai transform. And then you can prove that uh, the change that you have, uh, the transformation that you have in tautological bundles when you cross a wall, so you have two adjacent uh, chambers on the two sides uh, of the wall. Uh, this change is described by a composition of Fourier Mukai transforms. The one from, uh, corresponding to the constellation on one side and the one corresponding to the constellation on the other side. So it's one of these Fourier Mukai transforms times the inverse of the other. And these uh, describe exactly how the tautological bundle change. I think this is very interesting. And then two uh, lines uh, in which we are progressing. First, uh, it would be very nice to get uh, results. Uh, the the Croatia paper is for the Abelian case. So it would be nice to understand what's going on uh, in the non-Abelian case, uh, how far we can generalize the stuff. And another line of research, which is uh, uh, more differential geometric, is the search for rich flat uh, matrix uh, on these resolution singularities. This, by the way, uh, of course, the calabi yaus theorem about the existence of rich flat matrix uh, works uh, in the compact case. Here we are in a compact case. Anyway, you can look for uh, rich flat matrix. And there is a, a classical example due to Calabi. Uh, Calabi considered uh, the total space of the canonical bundle of P3 as a local Calabi hour, um, and constructed a rich flat matrix, uh, simply reducing uh, the determination of a rich flat matrix, I mean the rich flat condition, to an ordinary differential equation and, and solving it, and uh, therefore writing uh, a rich flat matrix, uh, depending on, uh, actually they are parameterized by, by the second cohomology group uh, with the coefficients in R. Um, it, this relates exactly one of our cases because the total space of the canonical bundle of P3 happens to be the case of C3 mod Z3, where Z3 acts by uh, uh, cubic, cubic roots of, uh, of unity, okay. so by matrices that are the product of uh, the identity matrix in three dimensions with a, cub a, a cubic root of, of units. And, uh, and uh, so, um, so this is a classical example, and we are trying to do this, uh, for instance, in our case, and then to find the general, some general theorem. This actually relates with the Sasakian geometry, because for instance, in the case of C3 mod Z3, this happens to be the space, the total space of the canonical bundle happens to be a, a Riemannian cone, uh, on a Sasakian variety. And also this is true for C3 mod Z4. However, in this case, it's a Sasakian or befold. Uh, so it's a, it's a little more general. So um, I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo. Are there uh, any questions? Please open your microphone. And, uh... um, I have a question. So thank you, Hugo, for the very nice talk. Um, can you can you put again the slide uh, twenty nine? Oh, sure. Can you see it? Uh, I see. Yes, I see. So. So this, uh, so when you have this uh, this wall and chamber decomposition, does this uh, correspond exactly to the the composition of the effective cone? The, normally we call it the more chamber decomposition of the effective cone. Is I this? So. I think so. Okay, I so details of this. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. So the question would be if. Um, if the if we, when you take the union of, of all these chambers, this would give uh, the effective cone of the the whole effective cone of the of of one of the the MC or of something in the generic chamber. Uh, so, in, in for instance, in my uh, guiding example, I mean the union of all cones is um, 
is, I mean, including the walls uh, is, is, is a vector space. Uh, uh -huh. It's the space of all stability conditions, and this is a vector space. Uh -huh. In our case, it's R3. Okay. Uh -huh. So I would just. Ah, okay. So. Mm -hmm. uh, please talk. Uh, no, sorry, I be, I, because I, I think what I'm, I'm not sure if this is the case, but in some cases that I've seen that that are similar, this vector space would be could be seen as a section of the neuron severe space, uh, a section, um, and then the the more the more chamber decomposition of the effective cone would project precisely to this chamber decompositions of the stability condition. I don't know if it, this is the case in in this example. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a very nice thing to check. Uh, I would expect that, but uh, I cannot swear. So let, uh -huh. let me say that it's a good suggestion, and uh, I'd like to understand it. Thanks. And in the in when you say something in the ch in the walls, so there you have a modelized space of sem uh, of semi-stable, right? Semi-stable G constellations. They may be. What really happens, you don't know. Okay. You don't know. Okay. You might have pure, purely semi-stable constellations because uh -huh. you are away from the locus where this is, they are. Um, they, uh, the stability parameters are genetic. So you might have some mistake. From some computations that I did, uh, in, in general, not for in, exactly in this case, I know that you can even find uh, um, generic, uh, um, yeah, you can find stable constellations also on the walls. This is what happens in this case uh, in, in the, in the, on the walls of type zero. Because nothing happens uh, when you cross a, a, a wall of type zero, including on the wall. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. More questions or comments? No, ask a question. Please go ahead. Try to get the microphone to work. Uh, so, in the classical Mackay correspondence, that's a, a two-dimensional representation of the finite group. And uh, there are corresponding to affine Dinkin diagrams. Yeah. So in terms of the, um, the, on the page 29, the wall crossing all those walls, uh, what, what's the good way of to interpret these walls from these uh, affine Dinkin diagrams in those special cases? In two dimensions, uh, all walls, all, the, all chambers always give the same result, right? Are they just the, the affine root system, the, the, affine, the root system across to walls and chambers? Am I correct? I don't think it's, uh, it's the chamber structure I'm talking about. Because uh, in, in, this, uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the singularity would be fixed. And then you look for resolution singularities that in principle might depend on, on a stability parameter. And, uh, and you find that uh, for all generic values, you get the same resolution, okay? Because in that case, they are always divis divisorial, the resolutions. And so I, I, I think that the thinking diagram is fixed. It's the thinking diagram of the, of the singularity you, you are resolving. So probably we are talking of, of different chamber, chambers. Oh, I see, okay. I was curious. Um... And my second question is that, uh, as I mentioned, that in a two-dimensional case, that with a very nice correspondence corresponding to this uh, affine, um, the algebra of uh, affine root systems for um, type of uh, uh, non-simple, simplest cases. So here I, I saw that you have many different interpretations of uh, yeah. a three-dimensional case. So, and do you know that anybody who thought what is the uh, kind of uh, object corresponding to in, in the place of uh, affine algebras? Yeah, it's like the so in, the, in two dimensions, what you have is that the, 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 the Dinkin diagram, for instance, gives you the intersection pattern of the components of the exceptional divisor. 
right? It's uh, in particular the intersection, intersection matrix uh, is given by minus the inverse of the Cartan matrix or something like that. It's basically the Cartan matrix. Um, uh, in three dimensions, it's much more complicated. I don't believe it's completely understood. And definitely, instead of the thinking diagrams, you have quivers. And these quivers uh, it this, it give you the, the when you have the the um, tautological bundles um, using uh, you can compute a lot of intersection numbers using the the the, um, the chair classes. You can compute a lot of intersection numbers. These are described by weight. I mean, um, what is the name? Weighted quiver. Yeah, a quiver with the weights uh, on the edges. So yeah, this is uh, more or less written. Uh, in, 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 there's a paper by by um, Reed. It's in a, in a it's in a um, I think it's a proceeding volume of a conference in Japan. He has a paper there where he describes uh, uh, this stuff, these quivers that uh, generalize uh, this. Um, the, the thinking diagram of the two dimensional case. Okay, thank you very much. That's very nice. More questions, anyone? Um, can I ask a quick question? Go ahead, Rodrigo. Hi, Hugo. Um, I was just wondering uh, regarding the physical dictionary that you uh, described, like if you know, like you mentioned that uh, these resolutions have an interpretations moduli space of vacuum yeah. uh, and n equals two gauge theory. Uh, do you know if it's if it's if if they are like the Higgs branch or the Coulomb branch of the theory? Oof. And this is uh, I don't know because uh, I don't know. But, uh, this is exactly what happens. Uh, let, let me circumvent the question in the following way. It's exactly what happens always in gauge theory. It's the branch which corresponds, for instance, when you have, uh, when you have, um, for instance, for instantons, right? You have uh, you have a supersymmetry Young Mills with uh, in four dimensions with two supersymmetries, okay? And then uh, and then uh, uh, this relates to a modular space of instantons. Uh, S uh, is exactly the, 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 the manifold of classical vacua. It's this kind of, uh, of uh, um, I think this is the Higgs branch, right? Uh, for, but I'm not sure, I, know, I never remember too well this stuff. I'm not sure. I know that the Coulomb branch has, the, has you know, this interpretation of, uh, you know, like there's some construction, like this guy Otto Mornitsky thing that you, you compactify a higher dimensional theory or like this, this super conformal deep theory in six dimensions on the Riemann surface, and your Coulomb branch is like a modular space of Higgs bundles on it. So I was wondering if that, if you know, if you could, if if that was related, if this was the Coulomb branch, then maybe it has an interpretation of a modular space of Higgs bundles. But I don't know about the Higgs branch. Like if it's a Higgs branch, then I have no idea. Uh, uh, let's say, let's say that I don't know. I don't know. I know that this is what I told you. So you have a gauge theory which starts with the classical Lagrangian. And then you, you rate it uh, right with the fermions uh, and the, the, the supersymmetric partners, whatever. But you start from a classical Lagrangian, and therefore, for the, for the related uh, for the classical field theory that you have out of that Lagrangian, you have uh, uh, a, from a physical viewpoint, you have a manifold of vacua of, of, of uh, minima of the of the action, and that is the modular space that you, that you get. And this is exactly the same sort here. And uh, I don't know more than that, however. Thanks. More questions? So I have a question myself, uh, Ugo. So you, you mentioned at some point that uh, part of this story also leads to some ADHM construction. You had that uh, commutator of A that resembles the uh, Kronheimer Nakajima construction. Yeah, it, was uh, yeah. it was a com comparison, I mean, analogy. analogy. Okay. But uh, yeah. do, 
do you know how to compare the uh, this uh, ADA gem type or quiver representation uh, with the usual Nakajima quiver it, 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 or Nakajima Kronheimer Nakajima construction? Is there a situation? I don't know the action of G factors through C two in which. Uh, I, I never understood that well because the quivers that you get. Uh, uh, are not uh, uh, of the Nakajima type. So, uh, you know, the equivalent of Nakajima type is something that by doubling, right? You start from a quiver, you frame it, you double it, and then you get a Nakajima quiver. But they are not of this. Uh, but I never studied, uh, they, are, they may be quite complicated, I never studied their representation varieties. But it might be interesting to to see. They are they are funny quivers, so. Uh, but I, I never did that. Could be another uh, direction of research. No, what I was saying is simply that, um, of course, you know, here, this seems to be an ADHM constraint. No. Yes. From equal to zero. I mean, it's a, this is a triple, of matrices actually, right? So it's a it's a. So it's very similar to, um, and when you have the differential geometric construction, you do exactly that. You, know, you have a Kähler form, which is the usual one, so to say. You have a moment map, which is the usual one. You take, you know, and you do the usual thing. And uh, so it's exactly the same construction, like in the Kronheimer case for the ADHM uh, construction is the same thing. However, while in the case of the ADHM, the standard one, of course, it's a very easy to write uh, down a quiver, right? You have a very easy recipe to write a quiver, and when you build the representation variety, uh, the, the modular space, I mean, of, uh, of representations, so you relate it to the instant modular space in a, very, in a clear way. Here, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Anyone? Okay, so uh, let's uh, please thank uh, Ugo again. Thank you very much. It's been very nice. Uh, great, Ugo. Thank you.